Welcome to Convo Fango. Today we are joined by Tommy McLaughlin, and we are talking about Diary of Pamela Voorhees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Diary of Pamela Voorhees. Is that like the official title of it or the working title of it at least? Yes. Um, I'm hoping to keep that title just mm -hmm. because that's kind of what this whole thing is, is getting a chance to get into her head. Right. Uh, which is very different, obviously, from the way a normal Friday would go. Um, and there's just that whole I idea to me of being able to, you know, watch Jason grow up under her tutelage. Yeah. And she's going further and further off the deep end as it, things go on because people aren't accepting her son. I mean, her son yeah. is mentally challenged and looks the way he looks. And, you know, if you're a single mother, you know, in between like 46 and 56, by the time she, you know, gets to Crystal Lake, you're not really welcome. I mean, our, our country was a very strange place after the war. And we kept thinking the Russians were going to attack, you know, people were building bomb shelters. Communism was like always on everybody's mind. Anytime somebody strange came to town, I wonder if they're communist, you know? So there's all, there was a lot of just psychological fears that were happening. And I thought that has to have kind of an effect on on Pamela as she's, you know, trying to get away from her past life and get into being a mother, you know, but all by herself. And right. uh, then obviously the choices she starts to make of how she gets rid of people, you know, who don't either accept her or accept her son, and it just gets more and more out of control. So yes. I thought the best way to help show that is that idea that she's writing down her thoughts and, you know, and things that she went through. So certain things that, that are better to be explained just quickly in a couple of sentences while we see her doing something, some, you know, breakthrough that Jason had for her, you know, again, being mentally challenged mm -hmm. or just that somebody is, she's not going to take this much longer. If this person says one more thing, that's it. And then we see that, psychological, you know, snapping, you know, that thing of going mm -hmm. from a sociopath, you know, into a total psychopath. But again, she can be as nice as can be to most people, but you flip that switch. And to me, she's an iconic monster that we've never had before. And mm -hmm. I really wanted, uh, you know, James Sweet and I, when we got into this, I said, I want to believe this really happened. I want this to make it seem like this is a real woman in the 40s that maybe hadn't heard about that was a serial killer in like the Midwest. And, you know, these are sort of the legends, the stories that went around and then she disappeared. I mean, I don't know whatever happened to her, probably died someplace, you know, but if you go watch you know, part one of the Friday series, that's what happened to her. Yeah, <laughs> right. Her this and is where she ended up, right. <laughs> exactly. So my my goal in this, re really, Angel, is, is to try to make a movie that if you never saw Friday the 13th, mm -hmm. it would still work. It'd be scary. It'd be creepy. It would have all those elements. And hopefully you go, gee, I got to go watch the first Friday now to see what happens and follow follow in. So hopefully we be more into our tribe. Um, and at the other hand, if you are a Friday fan, you know, there's so many Easter egg things. There's so many things that sort of end up, you know, having repercussions later on. Uh, but the, the, there was early setups of things that occurred with both Pamela and of course with Jason, as you're, as you're watching him slowly, you know, becoming what he's mm -hmm. gonna become. I love that concept of a prequel where we get more Pamela because she's such a, like, that reveal, the first time watching the original Friday the 13th, that reveal is such, like, a mind-blowing thing. And I feel I like it, it's hard to recapture that because now for people, even people who haven't seen it, a lot of people, maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe, I feel like people maybe know that reveal, but maybe if they're not familiar with the movies and haven't watched it, maybe they just think, okay, Jason, Friday the 13th, Jason. So maybe it still acts as a reveal. I don't know. I haven't, yeah. I haven't gotten to watch it with fresh eyes. I've been immersed in it for a very long time. So, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm envious, you know, of people who have like never seen this stuff and I'm like, oh God, what's like, what's it like? Like describe to me what you're feeling and what this is like. Is it a reveal? Do you already know? Because this has been around for a long time. Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, there's so many people out there that go, well, is he the one that has like the mask that looks like William Shatner? No, no, no. no. <laughs> no that's, that's Michael Myers. The other guy, the other guy. <laughs> and, yeah, there's so much confusion with like the norm, you know, public. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who's grown up in and around horror movies, of course, it's a no brainer, but it is amazing to me so many times how people 
you know, it depends when they saw these things too. Mm -hmm. um, when I do the conventions, most everybody who's like a really hardcore fan is like, dude, I saw your movie. I was like seven, man, <laughs> that was, you know, and then after that, I started watching all the other ones and stuff, but they all were kind of of an age where, you know, VHS was just really kicking off. Mm -hmm. And so you just go to Blockbuster and get as many different things that had cool covers. And then if right. there's something that worked like Freddy or Child's Play or whatever, you go and watched all the rest of them. And if it wasn't for that, you know, these movies would have not really taken off because even when I made my Jason Lives, I thought this thing's going to open and it's going to close, you know, maybe two weeks from now, if we're lucky. And that'll be <laughs> it. End of, end of story. You know, it's not going to go on TV. It's too intense, too gross. It's not like a cozy little Frankenstein or Dracula movie. <laughs> and what we never, you know, anticipated was VHS, of course, beta at first, VHS, and then, of course, on and on and to now streaming. You know, push a button, you get anything you want. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it really is shocking to me how many people, once they came to it, it became like like the, those universal monsters for me, like friends, you know. Mm -hmm. You got through things watching those somehow, you know, they, so many people said, yeah, my grandmother took me to it and my dad had just died and we bonded me and grandma over that movie. It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> I get it. You know, after you hear yeah. it enough times, you get it that people, you know, these are escape vehicles and it's not like they're relating to Jason, but they're up the pain and stuff, all that goes on. Somehow you escape into that world and that's, always what I've wanted to do as an entertainer is just forget whatever is going on with your life. Just, just escape into this for a short amount of time and then get back to whatever shit you got to deal with. But, you know, we're magicians, you know, we're trying to create illusions that hopefully people find entertaining and are, you know, drawn to. And it works. It does. And you, you've succeeded in that clearly. And it's such a weird thing to like trying to describe that to somebody who who doesn't get it, like something about like, you know, oh, my father just died and my grandma took me to this and like I, this was comfort for somebody who doesn't who hasn't experienced that. I think it's a very weird thing to try and explain. But yeah. for people that get it, it's like, OK, no, it makes sense. And I don't can't necessarily tell you why it makes sense always. But it just if, it, if you get it, then you get it. It's like one of those kind of things. I think a lot of people have those things. Usually they're not horror movies, you know? Yeah. Um, and again, there's all of us that have always felt like, you know, we're freaks, we're outsiders, people don't understand us. You know, there's that whole thing when you started going to these conventions, it's like, you know, the thing from Freaks, one of us, one of us. It's like, <laughs> yeah. there, there are all these people with, you know, Jason tattooed on them or, or Freddie and they're, they're the sweetest, nicest people in the world. And we all kind of came out of that, you know, they don't understand me because I'm gay. They don't understand me because, you know, I love this and I don't love that, or I'm not good in school, but I'm really good at drawing. And so it's all that outsider stuff. These, these movies kind of speak to that. And Absolutely. Like I said, it, it got me through a very difficult childhood too, because that's Edgar Allan Poe and all those, mm -hmm. you know, horror movies kind of is what I escaped into. So it's definitely very close to my heart. Yes, I was a big Poe fan as a kid too, so I love that you said that because that, that was for sure a gateway for me as well. I was like deep yeah. into Poe. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And when the <laughs> Roger Corman movie started coming out with Vincent Price, I would ditch school, <clears throat> take a bus, <laughs> go all the way down to Santa Monica. The school was in Los Angeles and there was a theater that started playing movies at noon. So I sat there all by myself, you know, 11, 12 year old kid, you know, just watching, you know, Vincent Price and, and the Hammer Horror movies and all of that. Mm -hmm. And there was something about having, you know, you're supposed to be at school and you're doing this and you don't know if you're going to get caught that just added to the experience right. all the more, you know, that, you know, you, you, you're not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> you're um, way fucking cooler than I am. I wish I had a story that cool. No, my ass was in school wishing that I was ditching and watching <laughs> Hammer <laughs> Horror. Well, I admire you people that got an education. Me, it's like that was the education, you know. It's, yeah. you know I struggle with math and everything else now. So, you know, like, you know, there's, as I say, pros and cons. Whatever I mean, math is not my, like, not my strong suit either. I mean, that's why I get paid to, for words, not not numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but I love, um, let's talk a little bit about, okay, it's no secret that Friday the 13th has been, like, engrossed in this, like, legal battle but yes. from my understanding where it stands right now is that they could license something 
as long as it deals with Jason not as an adult, right? So that's what this would fall under. Is Jason is a child in this? <laughs> yeah, this is this is a really tricky thing to answer, Angel, um, because there's no like surefire way to say, well, if you do this, this right. will happen. Um, at one point, I thought maybe. I mean, because I literally was badgered for almost 30 years to, are you ever going to do another one? I said, I just don't have any good ideas. I would. I was asked as soon as I finished Jason Lives, you want to do the next one? I go, Frank, you know, Frank Bancuso uh, Jr. was obviously the executive on that. I just don't have any. I put everything I knew into that one for right now. And I tried to add things that we haven't seen before and stuff. And then he said, Jason meets Freddy. I said, how would you do that? I mean, because Freddy was new line and stuff. Well, of course, it took many years before that finally happened. But I finally came up with something that I thought, well, this is something we haven't seen, which is Jason in dead winter, in a snowed in camp, you know? So it's like John Carpenter's the thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're isolated in this. And of course, Crystal Lake is frozen over. Um, and I said it 13 years, of course, you know, after mine. So it's 1919, which is again, a kind. I'm sorry, 1999, mm -hmm. which was kind of a very paranoid period for everybody who had computers and stuff because we didn't know mm -hmm. what was going to happen when that flipped over but y2k you know, and all of that yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> but as your as a teenager you know you didn't really give a shit i mean and what i thought would be interesting is to get a bunch of high school catholic girls who were just badass and a nun that has to take them on a retreat over thanksgiving weekend um to see if they get them to have some sort of redemption, you know, get them to, and of course, you know, there's no way, but she's <laughs> kind of the antagonist in the beginning. Cause I, I had some nuns that, I mean, I still have scars from <laughs> rulers and pencils. It's oh, like, gosh. oh, your right arm is, you know, is the one that you're supposed to write with, not your left. Cause I was left-handed oh, no. for that. Um, so, I mean, I, so I brought sort of that to the table as well as going, you know, it would be really cool. I think just to have badass girls that are still in high school you know going against somebody who they don't know who this guy is they came from another state there's no past like jason lives where we're kind of having fun with oh that could be jason out there they don't know who the hell this guy uh -huh. you know is that coming up and coming after him and he does have an agenda once again as i tried to give him one and jason lives about getting after tommy so that was kind of where i was going and then of course the thing kept you know, the, 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 you know, as soon as one thing would get resolved and Victor would get it, then Sean would appeal it mm -hmm. and everything stopped again. So I have this script, Jason Never Dies. I couldn't get anybody in this town to read it. It was like, what's the point? These guys are, you know, they're never going to come to terms. They hate each other. You know, I've come to learn it's not them as much as it's the lawyers and all the stuff around what this can mean, whoever gets what. Um, so at a certain point, um, I, I, I always call the guys who make the, the film fans, I mean, the fans films on um, Jason and, you know, tell them what I liked and, you know, what I thought was really inventive and things and compliment them on doing something that's never been done in the history of cinema, where the fans rise up and say, we'll pay for it. You guys have never made movies. That's OK. You make them, you know, and we all get our <laughs> name on the screen. And there's what, I don't know, 20 of them now, maybe mm -hmm. out there. And a few of them are actually, you know, really decent. And one I kind of responded to uh, was uh, Jason's uh, Jason Rising. And I got a hold of Vincent, who was a producer on that, and then James Sweet, who was the director. And he was the one that mentioned to me, you know, well, I was thinking about doing, you know, the, from the day Jason is born and then all the way into the camp and all that. And I went, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'd love to see that. And then I hung up and my mind snapped. I went, wait a minute. What, what would be that story between, you know, who is Pamela up to that point? And then what if it actually concluded once they get there what is that road trip mm -hmm. between you know single mother you know um obviously not looked upon as being very respectable um having this child and no husband and the child being something that most people go you know can't you sell them to a freak show or something jeez you know and of course she's getting more and more you know uh, annoyed and then starts to take action in the style that she does 
you know, in the first movie mm -hmm. because Pamela was not pulling any punches the way those kids were. You know, <laughs> right. So I thought <laughs> she's got to build for me. She's got to build to that. And I know there's a ton of fans out there. I know you guys like, no, I love the fact that she just, this is her revenge because of what they did to her son and things. And that's valid. I completely understand that. But I just felt like there's a hell of a story about somebody who gets to that point that they do it and they do it in that manner. You know, right. and I thought some of the worst murders that we have in society are passion kills. Um, needless to say, bring up OJ, you know, I mean, the way he attacked, you know, or the way the Manson crowd were doing things that they thought had a purpose. Mm -hmm. They're really brutal. And I mean, and somehow I felt, felt like Pamela's kills had some sort of, you know, revenge. They're not just arbitrary, like I did the movie the DC Sniper. And they were just shooting randomly, you know, mm -hmm. trying to create this terrorism, you know, uh, thing to, and get money. But these passion ones to me were, were kind of where I wanted to go. And I just felt like, you know, James, let's do this. So, you know, we started on this, I guess it's been almost a year now. And we kept finding so many stories and things to happen. It's like, we could do this as a limited series, you know, six, maybe 10 episodes if we can get that much out of it so we sort of devised it for both things you know as a, as a feature film or you know as a as something that would go on you know i don't know netflix if there's still going to be netflix tomorrow i don't know <laughs> you, know, Hulu, you know amazon whatever but you know a chance to actually kind of watch it you know over a period of time if that works but the, the kicker is in all this is that if i mean victor did win Pamela, young Jason, mm -hmm. and I think Crystal Lake and um, Adrian King's character. Um, I always think of Adrian, and I don't think of her name, the name of the character um, in the first one, uh, the final girl. Oh, God. I can't believe I can't think of it. Now I'm uh, thinking Adrian as well, and I'm also thinking of the book Final Girls, and Adrian narrates it, so now I'm just thinking <laughs> Adrian. <laughs> I think of her, of her character. I don't know why I'm blanking on that. Uh, it'll come to me in the middle of another That's thought. Okay. Um, so... And Sean owns the hockey mask, Jason. Mm -hmm. Piers, nobody actually owns the title Friday the 13th. Alice. Uh, Alice, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> God. Thank you. Oh, cutting uh, that part out, we're just going to say, and Adrian's character, Alice. Yeah. <laughs> it happens at old age, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, can, re can remember certain things and other things just kind of go on that <laughs> void, you know. Um, but they have to come to terms at some point because mm -hmm. say if, you know, somebody wants to do something with Victor, you know, and, and has the rights like what we're doing, it can only be shown in America. They do not have the rights for Europe. Sean has to give that over. So they have to agree at some point about, you know, where you're going to distribute it, what you're using and things. In the same way, I think if Sean makes something over here, he can't you know, call it Friday the 13th without Victor's say so. It's it's really confusing because I'm always hearing different stories about this. Um, but I know for a fact that they are trying very hard to come to some terms, the lawyers, about what side, you know, which way it's going to go first. Um, you know, you'll get this and I'll get that. And then this is for that, you know. So I don't know if we're going to end up having a whole bunch of Friday the 13th deals and there'll be Friday 13th, you know, <laughs> cartoon series <laughs> and somebody will do a little independent movie about the early days of Jason or, you know, I don't know if the market will get gutted with all these things mm -hmm. or if they'll be very, very like, OK, we'll do a, a, a Friday film with Jason first, you know, forget the Pamela thing. No one wants to see Pamela. It's like, all right. And maybe that might work as a series thing or start fresh. I mean, what I'm trying to do here is I did with Jason Lives is. If you're going to give me the job, let me do something with it. It hasn't been done mm -hmm. and see if rather than saying, well, we know what's going to happen in a Jason film. There's no two ways about it. And if you don't get that, you're going to be pissed. But you try to do it in a way that it's it still feels fresh, you know, mm -hmm. which is why I did the, the camp thing with the snow and the, you know, that whole world that hadn't right. been kind of mined. And the same thing here is I, I want people to be creeped out. I want them to be somehow almost have empathy for both Pamela and Jason, because what has happened to them has driven them 
you know, to this point. So it's not like we're, you know, crying or that sorry, but it's like, you know, I would be really pissed if somebody did that to right. me. I would be, you know, and it's hard that, not to because they get so shit on. You know what I yeah. mean? And for no, for no reason. So yeah. it's kind of hard to not be like. I mean, do I feel like you should have gutted this sixteen-year-old girl? No, but yeah. but also like I'm understanding why you're so pissed off. Also, yeah, yeah, and again, that's a great point. You know, she's only sixteen when this happens, and I've known a lot of young mothers, and basically, it's like you know, you're kind of done with your teenage days. Now you have to take care of a child. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a twist that happens in the beginning that shows that she truly is on her own. And she's already been violent once. Um, because again, she was kind of forced into it. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, what do you do? Where do you go? Where are you going to be accepted? How do you figure out how to take care of a child on your own as a, you know, teenager, not to mention that he's mentally challenged. Mm -hmm. So just the basic skills, uh, you know, of trying to work with him and he doesn't speak and, you know, but there's a growth that happens over that period of time and their relationships kind of change on and off, but it will deliver the scares. It will obviously deliver everything that somebody who loves a good horror movie, you know, are gonna expect. Mm -hmm. That I don't wanna say is not gonna be there, but, like Hannibal Lecter, you know, like Monster with Charlize with, uh, Theron, the character is going to be more of the thing that's interesting. And if this kind of ends up being its own franchise, who knows? I don't want to think that far. I just want to deliver a really <laughs> intense movie where it's like, you got to see this. This is this is where it all came from originally. And hopefully not have too many people pissed off because it isn't their way of how they saw it you know I'll tell you one of the worst stories about a friday the 13th I, I have i don't share this very often but years ago there was a documentary on kids who kill and it, you know it was a series of different things where people who are underage did something you know that that you know caused the death of somebody and there was one kid who was like 13 and um they were talking to him and you know he he was you know you could see he really kind of was disassociated with a lot of stuff. And, you know, and the interviewer was saying, you know, so what was going on in your head? You know, I mean, you're killing your best friend's mother. It's like, yeah, yeah, he, he, he couldn't stand her and I couldn't stand her. And it's like, but what were you thinking? I was thinking I was Jason. And they cut to my poster, Jason oh, Little. Oh, God. start moving in on it, you know, and he's going on about, yeah, because, you know, I knew as Jason, I could, I could kill her. I could get through it. I'm going, Oh God, no. Oh no. <laughs> no. And about a year later, I'm directing a play in San Francisco and a guy stays afterwards that says, I want to talk to you. And I go, Oh yeah, great. Did you like to play? Yeah. But I'm more interested in your credit here. You directed a Friday the 13th. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sure, you know, it, it's like, no, 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 no. I got to tell you, I run a class where we bring in people and we, put hockey masks on these kids and stuff and let them take out their rage on these inanimate objects and stuff. It has been such a healing thing. So I just want to say you guys actually, for me, did a good thing with this faceless, you know, aggressive creature. And I thought, boy, talk about yin and yang. Yeah. A simple, entertaining, I thought entertaining thrill ride kind of movie that somebody saying, yeah, well, it's helping people. And this other kids use it as, well, yeah, that was the gasoline, you know, oh, that God. caused the fire. <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 strange, you know. But movies do. I know I carry around Rocky in that fifteenth round, pulling himself on, up on those ropes <laughs> yeah. through my whole career. Every time I was knocked down, going, yeah. "Nope, I gotta get up. I gotta get up." I, you know, just go the distance. You know, and there's those iconic moments that we all mm -hmm. experience in the theater um, that are magic. You know, and somehow have a huge part of how how we become. I don't. I, I as I said, I don't really have any reservations about things that have happened. And there's a lot of things I wish that could have happened. I mean, I should have said yes to scream instead of no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I read it and I went to the agent. I think I already kind of made this movie. Like, <laughs> that time, you know, so I let it go. And then six months later, I said, is that still available? No, nope, Wes Craven got it. I go, oh, well, he'll do a great job. Wes is great. Okay. So I mean, there's a few of those, a pilot of CSI, another one. Like I just did a show on the coroner's office <laughs> Nobody wanted to see it. In fact, Michael Eisner, Michael Eisner at Disney ABC canceled it because he had a triple bypass and he didn't think medical examiners, you know, 
people wanted to see shows about that. You know, we were like a year or two ahead of our time. And so oh, now man. there's nothing but those shows. So again, you make choices that you go, well, you know, at the time it seemed like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was not the right choice. And, you know, later on, it's like, <sighs> I could be living in a mansion today, but where am I? <laughs> Cozy little house in Burbank. Which I still think is pretty fucking cool, all right? Like, to me, I'm like, yeah, you got your Tommy Land. You got the <laughs> you got the tombstones and the fairy garden. Like, I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> I can always lay in Jason's coffin at night if I can't sleep, you know. There you go. See, I can't say that, so I think that's pretty great. 